Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Napier Court by Ramsey Campbell Alma Napier sat up in bed. Five minutes ago, she'd lain down, victims de Bois to cough, then stared round her bedroom, heavy-eyed. The partly open door reflected panels of cold October sunlight, which glanced from the flowered wallpaper, glared from the glass-fronted bookcase, but left the metronome on top in shadow and failed to reach the corner where her music stand was standing. She thought she had heard footsteps on the stairs. Beyond the brilliant panel, she could see the darker landing. She waited for someone to appear. Her clock displayed within its glass tube showed 11.30. It must be Maureen, then she thought. Could it be her parents? Had they decided to give up their holiday after all? She looked forward to being left alone for a fortnight when her cold had confined her to the house. She wanted time to prove herself, to make her own way. She felt a stab of misery as she listened. Couldn't they leave her alone for two weeks? Didn't they trust her? The silence thickened. The darkness on the landing seemed to move. Who's there? Is that you, Maureen? She called and coughed. The darkness moved again. Of course it didn't, she said willing her hands to unclench. She held up one, the little finger twitched. Don't be childish, she told herself. Where's your strength? She slid out of the cocoon of warmth, slipped on her slippers and dressing gown, and went downstairs. The house was empty. You see, she said aloud. What else had she to expect? She entered the kitchen. On the window sill sat the medicine her mother had bought. I don't like to leave you alone, she would said two hours ago. Promise you'll take this and stay in bed until you're better. I've asked Maureen to buy anything you need while she's shopping. Mother Alma had protested. I could have asked her. After all, she is my friend. I know I'm being overprotective. I know I can't expect to be liked for it anymore. And oh God, Alma thought. All the strain of calming her down, of parting friends, there was no longer any question of love. As her mother was leaving the bedroom, while her father bumped the last case down to the car, she said, Alma, I don't want to talk about Peter, as you well know, but you did promise. I've told you, Alma had replied somewhat sharply, I shan't be seeing him again. That was all over. She wished everything was over. All this possessiveness which threatened to erase her completely, she wished she could be left alone with her music. But that was not to be. Not for two years. There was the medicine bottle, incarnating her mother's continued influence in the house. Taking medicine for a cold was a sign of weakness, in Alma's opinion. But her chest hurt terribly when she coughed. After all, her mother wasn't imposing it on her. If she took it, it was her own indecision. She measured a spoonful and gulped it down. Then she padded determinedly through the hall, past the living room, her father's desk, reflected in one mirror, the dining room, her mother's flower arrangement, preserved under glass in another and upstairs, past her mother's Victorian valentines, framed above the ornate banister. Now she ordered herself to bed, and another chapter of Victimes de Bois, before Maureen arrived. She'd never make the Brightchester French circle if she carried on like this. But as soon as she climbed into bed, trying to preserve its bag of warmth, she was troubled by something she remembered having seen. In the hall, what had been wrong? She caught it. As she'd mounted the stairs, she'd seen a shape in the hall mirror. Maureen's coat hanging on the coat stand. But Maureen wasn't here. Certainly something pale had stood against the front door panes. About to investigate, she addressed herself. The house was empty. There could be nothing there. All right, she'd asked Maureen, to check the story of the house in the library's files of the Bridgechester Herald. But that didn't mean she believed the hints 
she had heard in the corner shop that day before her mother had intervened with, Now, Alma, don't upset yourself. And to the shopkeeper, haunted indeed. I'm afraid we grew out of that sort of thing in Sevenford. If she had seemed to glimpse a figure in the hall, it merely meant she was delirious. She'd ask Maureen to check purely because she wanted to face up to the house, to come to terms with it. She was determined to stop thinking of her room as a refuge, where she was protected by her music. Before she left the house, she wanted to make it a step toward maturity. The darkness shifted on the landing. Tired eyes, she explained, yet her room enfolded her. She reached out and removed her flute from its case. She admired its length, its shine, the perfection of its measurements as they fitted to her fingers. She couldn't play it now. Each time she tried, she coughed. But it seemed charged with beauty. Her appreciation over, she laid the instrument to rest in its long black box. You retreat into your room and your music, Peter had said that. But he'd been speaking of a retreat from Hiroshima, from the conditions in Lower Bradchester, from all the horrid things he'd insisted she confront. That was over, she said quickly, and the house was empty. Their eyes strayed from Big Tom's de devoir. Footsteps on the stairs again. This time she recognized Maureen's. The others, which she hadn't heard, of course, had been indeterminate, even sexless. She thought she'd ask Maureen whether she'd left her coat in the hall. She might have injured while Alma had slept. With a key she borrowed, the door opened and the panel of sunlight fled, darkening the room. No thought, Alma. To inquire into possible delusions would be an admission of weakness. Maureen dropped her carrier and sneezed. I think I've got your cold, she said indistinctly. Oh, dear. Alma's mood had darkened with the room, with her decision not to speak. She searched for conversation in which to lose herself. Have you heard yet when you're going to library school, she asked. It's not settled yet. I don't know. The idea of a spinster career is beginning to depress me. I'm glad you're not faced with that. You shouldn't brood, Alma advised, restlessly stacking her books on the bedspread. Maureen examined the titles. Victimes de Devoir? Therese Desquiru? In the original French? Good Lord. Why are you grappling with these? So that'll be an interesting young woman, Alma replied instantly. I'm sure I've told you I feel guilty doing nothing. I can't practice, not with this cold. I only hope it's passed before the campsite concert. Which reminds me, do you think I could borrow your transistor during the day for the music program to give me peace? All right. I can't today. I start work at one. Though, I think no, it doesn't matter. Go on. Well, I agree with Peter. You know that. You can't have peace and beauty without closing your eyes to the world. Didn't he say that to seek peace in music was to seek complete absence of sensation, of awareness? He said that, and you know my answer, Alma unwillingly remembered. He had been here in her room, taking in the music in the bookcase, the polished gramophone. She'd sensed his disapproval and felt miserable. Why couldn't he stay the strong, forthright man she'd come to admire and love? Really, darling, this is an immature attitude, he'd said. I can't help feeling you want to abdicate from the human race and its suffering. Her eyes embraced the room. This was security. Apart from the external chaos, the hard part of life. Even you appreciate the beauty of the museum exhibits, she told Maureen. I suppose that's why you work there. I admire them, yes, but in many cases, by ignoring their history of cruelty. Why must you and Peter always look for the hard things? What about this house? There are beautiful things here. That gramophone? You can look at it and imagine all the craftsmanship it took. Doesn't that seem to you fulfilling? You know, we leftists have a functional aesthetic. Anyway, Maureen paused. If that's your view of the house, you'd best not know what I found out about it. Go on, I want to hear. If you insist. The Brychester Herald was useless. They reported the death of the owner, and that was all. But I came across a chapter 
and Pamela Jones' book on local hauntings, which gives the details. The last owner of the house lost a fortune in the stock market. I don't know how exactly, of course. It's not my field. And he became a recluse in this house. There's worse to come. Are you sure you want to? Well, he went mad. Things started disappearing, so he said, and he accused something he thought was living in the house, something that used to stand behind him or mock him from the empty rooms. I can imagine how he started having hallucinations. Looking at this view, Alma joined her at the window. Why, she disagreed. I think it's beautiful. She admired the court before the house, the stone pillars framing the iron flourish of the gates. Then a stooped woman passed across the picture, leaving a pram from which overflowed a huge cloth bag of washing. Alma fed the press again. The scene was spoiled. Sorry, Alma, Maureen said. Her cold hand touched Alma's fingers. Alma frowned slightly and insinuated herself between the sheets. Sorry, Maureen said again. Do you want to hear the rest? It's conventional, really. He gasped himself. The Jones book has something about a note he wrote. And saying, of course, he said he wanted to fade into the house. The one possession left to me, whatever that meant. Afterwards, the story started. People used to see someone very tall and thin standing at the front door on moonlit nights. And one man saw a figure at an upstairs window with its head turning back and forth like clockwork. Yes, and one of the neighbors used to dream that the house was screaming for help. The book explained that, but not to me, I'm afraid. I shouldn't be telling you all this. You'll be alone until tonight. Don't worry, Maureen. It's just enjoyably creepy. A perceptive comment. It blinds you to what really happened. To think of him in this house, possessing the rooms, eating, sleeping. You forget he lived once. He was real. I wonder which room. You don't have to harp on it, Alma said. You sound like Peter. Poor Peter. You are attacking him today. He'll be here to protect you tonight, after all. He won't, because we've parted. You could have stopped me talking about him then, but how, for God's sake, did it happen? Oh, on Friday, I don't want to talk about it. Walking hand in hand to the front door, and as always kissing as Peter turned the key, her father waiting in the hall. Now listen, Peter, this can't go on. Prompted by her mother, Alma knew, her father was too weak to act independently. She'd pull Peter into the kitchen. Go, darling, I'll try and calm them down. She said desperately, but her mother was waiting, immediately animated, like a fairground puppet by a penny. You know you've broken my heart, Alma, marrying beneath you. Alma had slumped into a chair, but Peter leaned against the dresser. Facing them all, her mother's prepared speech. Peter, I will not have you marrying Alma. You're uneducated. You'll get nowhere at the library. You're obsessed with politics. You don't care how much they distress Alma. And on and on. If only he'd come to her instead of standing pugnaciously apart. She looked up at him finally, tearful, and he said, Well, darling, I'll answer any point of your mother's you feel is not already answered. And suddenly... Everything had been too much. She'd run sobbing to her room. Below, the back door had closed. She wrenched open the window. Peter was crossing the garden beneath the rain. Peter, she cried out. Whatever happens, I still love you. But her mother was before her, pushing her away from the window, shouting down. Go back to your kennel. What? She asked Maureen, distracted back. I said, I don't believe it was your decision. It must have been your mother. That's irrelevant. I broke it off finally. Her letter. It would be impossible to continue when my parents refused to receive you. But anyway, I don't want to anymore. I want to study hard and become a musician. She'd posted it on Saturday after a sleepless sobbing night. And immediately she felt released, at peace. Then she thought something that disturbed her. It must have reached Peter by now. Surely he wouldn't try to see her, but he wouldn't be able to get in. She was safe. You can't tell me you love your mother more than Peter. 
you're simply taking refuge again. Surely you don't think I love her now, but I still feel I must be loyal. Is there a difference between love and loyalty? Never having had either, I wouldn't know. Good God, Alma, stop barricading yourself with pseudo-philosophy. If you must know, Maureen, I shall be leaving them as soon as I've paid for my flute. They gave it to me for my 21st, and now they're threatening to take it back. It'll take me two years, but I shall pay. And you'll be 25. God Almighty, why? Bowing down to private ownership? You wouldn't understand any more than Peter would. You've returned the ring, of course. No, Alma shifted victoires de devoir. Once I asked Peter if I could keep it if we broke up. Two weeks before their separation, she felt the pressures, her parents' crush, his horrors, misshaping her callous as thumbs on plasticine, and he'd replied that there'd be no question of their breaking up, which she'd taken for a cent. And Peter's feelings? Maureen let the question resonate, but it was muffled by the music. Maureen, I just want to remember the happy times. I don't understand that remark. At least, perhaps, I do, but I don't like it. You don't approve? I do not. Maureen brandished her watch. From her emotion, she might have been about to slap Alma. I can't discuss it with you. I'll be late. She buttoned herself into her coat on the landing. I suppose I'll see Peter later, she said, and clumped downstairs. With a slam, Alma was alone. Her hot water bottle chilled her toes. She thrust it to the foot of the bed. The room was darker. Rain patted the pane. The metronome stood solid in the shadow, as if stilled forever. Maureen might well see Peter later. They both worked at Brychester Central Library. What if Maureen should attempt to heal the breach, to lend Peter her key? It was the sort of thing Maureen might well do, particularly as she liked Peter. Alma recalled suggesting once that they take Maureen out. She does seem lonely, Peter, only to find the two of them ideologically united against her. The most difficult two hours she'd spent with either of them, listening to their agreement on Vietnam and the rest across the cocktail bar table. Horrid. Later she'd go down and bolt the door. But now? She turned restlessly in Big Tom's devoir, toppled to the floor. She felt guilty not to be reading on, but she yearned to fill herself with music. The shadows weighed on her eyes. She pulled a cord for light. Spray laced the windows like cobwebs on a misty morning. Outside, the world was late. The needle on her gramophone was dulled, but she selected the first record, Britain's Nocturne. Finnegan's half-awake, Peter had commented. She had never understood what he meant. She placed the needle and let the music expand through her, flowing into troubled crevices. The beauty of Peter's pair's voice. Peter. Suddenly, she was listening to the words, sickly light, huge sea worms. She picked off the needle. She didn't want it to wear away the beauty. Usually, Britain could transmute all to beauty. Had Peter's pitiless vision thrown the hard part into such relief? Once she'd taken him to a concert of the war requiem, and in the interval he commented, I agree with you. Britain succeeds completely in beautifying war, which is precisely my objection. And later he'd admitted that for the last half hour he'd been pitying the poor cymbal player bobbing up and down on cue as if in church. That was his trouble. He couldn't achieve peace. Suppose he came to the house, she thought again. Her gaze flew to the bedroom door, the mass dark on the landing. For a moment she was sure that Peter was out there. Wasn't someone watching her from the stairs? She coughed jaggedly. It recalled her. Deliberately she lifted her flute from its case and rippled a scale before the next cough came. Later she'd practice no matter how she coughed. Her breathing exercises might cure her lungs. I found all these exercises a little terrifying, said Peter. A little robotic. She frowned miserably. He seemed to wait wherever she saw peace, but thoughts of him carried her to the dressing table drawer, to a ring. She didn't have to remember the diamond itself crystallized beauty. She turned the jewel, but it refused to sparkle beneath the heavy sky. 
Had he been uneducated? Well, he'd known nothing about music. He'd never known what a cadenza was. What's the point of your academic analysis? Where does it touch life? She snapped the lid of the ring and restored it to its drawer. From now on, she'd allow herself no time for disturbing memories. Downstairs for soup. She must eat. Then her flute exercises followed by Victoire's devoir until she needed sleep. The staircase merged into the hall, vaguely defined beneath her drowsiness. The Victorian Valentine seemed dusty in the dusk, neglected in the depths of an antique shop. As Alma passed the living room, a stray light was caught in the mirror, and a memory was trapped, herself and Peter on the couch, separating instantly, tongues retreating guiltily into mouths. Each time the opening door flashed in the mirror, towards the end Peter would clutch her rebelliously, but she couldn't let her parents come on them embracing, not after their own marriage had been drained of love. We'll be each other's peace, she had once told Peter, secretly aware as she spoke that she was terrified of sex. Once they were engaged, she felt a duty to give in, but she panted uncontrollably, her mouth gulping over his shaming her. One dreadful night, Peter had rested his head on her shoulder, and she'd known that he was consulting his watch behind her back. And suddenly, weeks later, it had come right. She was at peace, soothed her fears, almost engulfed, which was precisely when her parents had shattered the calm, the door thrown open, jarring the mirror. Peter, this is a respectable house. I won't have you keeping us all up like this until God knows what hour, even if you are used to that sort of thing. And then that final confrontation. Quickly, Alma told herself onward. She thrust the memories back into the darkness of the two dead rooms to be crushed by her father's desk, choked by her mother's flowers. On the kitchen windowsill, the medicine was black against the back garden, the gray grass plastered down by rain, It loomed like a poison bottle in a Hitchcock film. What was Peter doing at this moment? Where would he be tonight? She fumbled sleepily with a tin of tomato soup and watched it gush into the pan. Where would he be tonight? With someone else? If only he would try to contact her, to show her he still cared. Nonsense. She turned up the gas. No doubt he'd be at the cinema. He tried to force films on her. Past her music such as the film they'd seen on the afternoon of their parting, the afternoon they'd taken off work together. Hurry sundown. It hadn't been the theme of racism which had seemed so horrid, but those scenes with Michael Caine sublimating her sex drive through his saxophone. She brushed her hair against Peter's cheek, hopefully desperately, but he was intent on the screen, and she could only guess his thoughts too accurately. Perhaps he and Maureen would find each other. Alma hoped so. Then she could forget about them both. The soup bubbled and she poured into a dish. Gas sweetened the air. She checked the control, but it seemed turned right. The dresser there had stood pugnaciously apart, watching her. She set the medicine before her on the table. She'd take it upstairs with her. She didn't want to come downstairs again. In her mind, she overcame the suffocating shadow of the room, thick with years of tobacco smoke in one, with lavender water in another, by her shining flute, the sheets of music brightly turning. A dim, thin figure moved down the hall towards the kitchen. It hadn't entered by the front door, rather, had it emerged from the twin vista in the hall mirror. Alma sipped her soup, not tasting it, but warmed. The figure fingered the twined flowers, sat at her father's desk. Alma bent her head over the plate. The figure stood outside the kitchen door, one hand on the doorknob. Alma stood, but her chair screeched. She saw herself pulled erect by panic in the familiar kitchen, like a child in darkness, and willed herself to sit. The figure climbed the stairs, entered her room, padded through the shadows, Examining her music, breathing on her flute, Alma's spoon tipped and the soup drained back into its disc. Then determinedly, she dipped again. 
She had to fasten her thoughts on something as she mounted the stairs, medicine in hand. She thought of the campsite orchestral concert next week. Thank God she wouldn't be faced with Peter chewing gum amid the ranks of placid, rufted eggs. She felt for her bedroom light switch. Behind the bookcase, shadows sprang back into hiding and were defined. She smiled at the room and at herself. Then carefully, she closed the door. After the soup, she felt a little hot, lightheaded. She moved to the window and admired the court set back from the bare street. Above the roofs, the sky was diluted lime and lemon beneath clouds like wads of stuffing. Napier Court. I see the point, but don't you think that naming a house is a bit pretentious? Almost lit her feet through the cold sheets, recoiling from the frigid bottle. She'd fill it later. Now she needed rest. She set aside Victoire's de Bois and lay back on the pillow. Alma awoke. Someone was outside in the landing. At once she knew. Peter had borrowed Maureen's key. He came into the room, and as he did so, her mother peered from behind the door and drove the music stand into his face. Alma awoke. She was swaddled in blankets, breathing through them. For a moment, she lay inert. One hand was limp between her legs, her ear pressed on the pillow. These two parts of her felt miles distance and something vast throbbed silently against her eardrums. She cataloged herself. Slight delirium, a yearning for the toilet. She drifted with a bed she disliked to emerge to be oriented by the cold. Nonsense, don't indulge your weakness, she told herself, and poked her head out. Surely, she left the light on. Darkness blindfolded her, warm as the blankets. She reached for the cord, and the blue window blackened as the room appeared. The furniture felt padded by delirium. Alma burned. She struggled into her dressing gown and saw the clock, 12.05. Past midnight, and Maureen hadn't come. Then she realized the clock had stopped. It must have been around the time of Maureen's departure. Of course, Maureen wouldn't return. She'd been repelled by disapproval, which meant that Alma would have no transistor, no means of discovering the time. She felt as if she floated, bodiless, disoriented, robbed of sensation, and went to the window for some indication. The street was deserted, as it might be at any hour soon after dark. Turning from the pain, she pivoted in the mirror. Behind her, the bed stood at her left. That wasn't right. Right was where it stood. Or did it reverse in the reflection? She turned to look, but froze. If she faced round, she'd meet a figure waiting, hands outstretched, one side of its face incomplete, like those photographs from Vietnam Peter had insisted she confront. The thought released her. She turned to an empty room. So much for her delirium. Deliberately, she switched out the light and patted down the landing. On her way back, she passed her mother's room. She felt compelled to enter. Between the twin bed shelves displayed the Benjamins, the books on Greece, histories of the Severn Valley. On the beds, the sheets were stretched taut as one finds them on first entering a hotel room. When Peter had stayed for weekends, her father had moved back into this room. Her father, out every night to the pub with his friends, he hadn't been vindictive to her mother, just unfeeling and unable to adjust to her domestic rhythm. When her mother had accused Alma of marrying beneath her, she spoken of herself. Deceptively freed by their absence, Alma began to understand her mother's hostility to Peter. You're a handsome bugger, her mother had once told him. Alma had pinpointed that as a genesis of her hostility. She had preyed on her mother's mind, this lowering herself to say what she thought he'd like only to realize that the potential of this vulgarity lurked within herself. Now Alma saw the truth. Once more sleeping in the same room as her husband, she'd had the failure of her marriage forced upon her. She projected it on to Alma's love for Peter. Alma felt released. She had understood them. Perhaps she could even come once more to love them, just as eventually she'd understood that buying Napier Court had fulfilled her father's ambition to own a house in Brychester. Her father trying to talk to Peter, who never communicated to him. He might have been unable, but this was no longer important. Finally, 
walking away from Peter whistling, Release me, which he reprised the day after the separation. Somewhat unfeelingly, she thought. Even this she could understand. To seal her understanding, she turned out the light and closed the door. Immediately a figure rose before her mother's mirror, combing long fingers through its hair. Alma managed not to shudder. She strode to her own door, opened it on blackness, and crossed to her bed. She reached out to it and fell on her knees. It was not there. As she knelt trembling, the house rearranged itself around her. The dark corridor and rooms, perhaps not empty as she prayed, watched pitilessly, came to bear upon her. She staggered to her feet and clutched the cord, almost touching a gaping face, which was not there when the light came on. Her bed was inches from her knees where it had been when she left it. She insisted, yet this failed to calm her. There was more than darkness in the house. She was no longer comfortably alone in her warm and welcoming home. Had Peter borrowed Maureen's key? All at once she hoped he had. Then she'd be in his arms, admitting that her promise to her mother had been desperate. She yearned for his protection, strengthened by it. She believed she might confront horrors if he demanded them. She watched for Peter from the window. One night, while he was staying, Peter had come to her room. She focused on the court. It seemed cut off from the world, imprisoning. Eclipsed by the gatepost, a pedestrian crossing beacons exchanged signals without meaning. She thought of the others flashing far into the night on cold, lonely country roads and shivered. He had come into her room. It caressed furtively and whispered so as not to wake her parents, though now she suspected that her mother had lain awake, listening through her father's snores. Take me, she pleaded. But in the end, she couldn't. The wall was too attentive. Now she squirmed at her remembered endearments. My nice Peter, my handsome Peter, my lovely Peter. And at last, her halting praise of his body, the painful search for new phrases. She no longer cared to recall. She slowed off the memories with an epileptic shudder. Suddenly a man appeared in the gateway of the court. Alma Siffin. The figure passed. She relaxed, but only for a moment. Had there not been something strange about its long, loping stride, its trailing shadow? This was childish, she rebuked herself. She had no more need to become obsessed with someone hastening to a date than with Peter, who was no longer in a position to protect her. She turned from the window before the figure should form behind her and picked up her flute. Half an hour of exercise, then sleep, she opened the case. It was empty. It was as if her mother had returned and taken back the flute. She felt the house again rise up around her. She grasped an explanation. Last time she'd fingered her flute, when had that been? Time had slipped away. She had replaced it in its case. She threw the sheets back from the bed, only the dead bottle was exposed. She knelt again and peered beneath the bed. Something bent above her, waiting, grinning. No, the flute hadn't rolled. She stood up, and the figure moved behind her. Don't, she whimpered. At that moment, she saw that the dressing table drawer was open. She took one step towards it to a ring, but could not look into it, knowing what was there. A face peering up at her from the drawer, its eyes opening infinitely slowly the lashes parting stickly. Delirium again, it didn't matter. Alma's lips trembled. She could still escape. She went to the wardrobe, but nothing could have made her open it. Instead, she caught up her clothes from the chair at the foot of the bed and dressed clumsily, dragging her skirt around to reach the zip. The room was silent. Her music had fled, but any minute something else would take its place. Since she had to face the darkened house, she did so. She trembled only once. The Victorian Valentines hung immobile. The mirrors extended the darkness, strengthened its power. The house waited. Alma fell into the court. From the cobblestones, the erect gateposts, the street beyond, she drew courage. Two years, and she'd be far from here. A complete person, 
freed from fear. She left the front door open, but she shivered. The night air knifed through her, the dangerous warmth of her cold. She must go where? To Maureen, she decided. That was not too far, and she knew Maureen to be kind. She'd forget her disapproval if she saw Alma like this. Alma strode towards the orange fan, which flared from the beacon behind the gatepost, and stopped. Resting against the beacon was a white bag, half as high as Alma. She'd seen such bags before full of laundry, yet she could not force herself to pull back the gates and pass. Suddenly the gates were her protection against the shapeless mass, for deep within herself she suppressed the horror that the bag might move towards her, flapping. It couldn't be what it appeared. Who would have left it there at this time of night? A car hissed past on the glittering tarmac. Alma choked a scream for help. Screaming in the middle of the street, what would her mother have thought? Musicians didn't do that sort of thing. Besides, why shouldn't someone have left the bag of washing at the crossing while she went for help to heft it to the laundry? Alma touched the gates and withdrew, chilled. Here she was risking pneumonia in the night, and for what? The panic of delirium? As a child, she'd screamed hoarsely through her cold that a man was bending over her. She was too old for that. Back to bed. No. To find her flute. Then to bed. To purge herself of these horrid visions. Ironically, she thought, Peter would be proud of her if she knew. Her flute. Must the two years any longer have any meaning? Still touched by understanding, she couldn't think that her parents would hold to their threat made after all before she'd written to Peter. What well, must have been a night breeze moved the bag, forcing her footsteps not to drag. Alma left the orange radiance and closed the door behind her. Her last test. In the hall, the thing she had thought was Maureen's coat shifted wakefully. Alma ignored it, but her flesh crept hot and cold. At the far end of the hall mirror, a figure approached, arms extended as if blindly. Alma smiled. It was too like a childish fear to frighten her. Enjoyably creepy, she tried to recapture her mood of the morning, but every organ of her body felt hot and pounding. She broke and ran to her room. The light, oddly, was still on. In the room below, her father's desk creaked. The flower arrangements arrived. Did it matter? Alma argued desperately. There was no lock on her door, but she refused to barricade it. There was nothing solid or broad in the house, nothing to harm her but the lure of her own fears. Her flute. She wouldn't play it once she found it. She'd go to bed with its protection. She moved around the bed and saw the flute overlaid by Victoire de Bois. The flute was bent in half. One tear pressed from Alma's eyes before she realized the full horror. As she whirled completely disoriented, a mirror crashed below. Something shrieked towards her through the corridors. She sank onto the bed, defenseless, wishing all were over. Music blasted from the record player, the nocturne. Alma leapt up and screamed. In roaring he shall rise, the voice bawled, and on the surface, a music stand was hurled to the floor. Die. The needle scraped across the record and clicked off. The wall seemed on the point of tearing, bulging inwards. Alma no longer cared. She screamed once. She could do no more. Now she waited. When the figure formed deep in the mirror, she knew that all was over. She faced it. Drained of feeling, it grew closer, arms stretched out. Its face inflated, gray by gas. Alma wept. It was horrid. She knew who it was. A shaft of truth had pierced the suffocating warmth of her delirium. The suicide had possessed the house. Was the house. He had waited for someone like her. Go on, she sobbed at him. Take me. The bloated cheeks moved in a swollen grin. The arms stretched out for her and vanished. The house was empty. Alma was surrounded by a vacuum into which something must rush. She stood up shaking and fell into the vacuum. Her sight was torn away. She tried to move. There was no longer any muscles to respond. She felt nothing but utter horror closed her in. Somewhere she sensed her body 
moving happily on her bedroom carpet, picking up her ruined flute, breathing a hideous note into it. She tried to scream, impossible. Only in dreams can houses scream for help.